So, um, sad day for the Jewish nation today. Uh, Rabbi Yashif passed away today. Leviah was just um, over not that long ago. Um, we also had a terrible bomb um, in Bolivia where seven Israelis were killed. Um, Nebuch, a little boy, was nifter in, um, in Deal. Um, very Mishunadika death. Um, on, he w- was digging a tunnel um, in the sand by the beach and it caved in on him. So it's just three weeks. It's, we're approaching the nine days. And um, it's a time for introspection, but you know, it's interesting the reaction to Rabbi Yoshev passing away. A lot of people said to me, Ive, we're now in trouble. Um, we're in trouble anyway, whether he passed away or not, but the, the misa, misa of tzaddikim is, mecha, is mechaper. The death of a tzaddik is, Hashem takes a tzaddik, instead of taking it out on the rest of the nation, he, the, the tzaddik sort of is the one that gives up his life for Klai Yisrael. But I think that, that we, you know, he was, he was not young, but Lemaisa, when a tzaddik passed away, a lot of people in Eretz Yisrael, they, they actually raised Kriya. A lot of the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael, they, they, they tore their clothing when a tzaddik dies, a Gadol Hadar, there's no question of Yashuv was, is, was the Gadol Hadar in Klai Yisrael as far as halacha, um, he was the top. In other words, they would go and ask a rub, he wouldn't know, they would ask a, he was the top. Rav Chaim, of course, was his son-in-law, Kainevsky, would send everyone to, to travel Yashuv. So we definitely lost the Moshe Rabbeinu of Adar, um, he was the leader of the Dar, and that puts pressure on everybody else in the Dar, but as it says in the Gemara, that Rabbi Akiva was walking um, amongst the ruins of the Beis Hamikdash, and there was a fox, and all the tzaddikim started crying that in the place where the Kohen Gadol could not go, a whole year only on Yom Kippur and the Kaddish Kedashim. Now there were animals running through that same place that was so holy. What a sad, what a sad scene! The place where the Makom Hamikdash, the Kaddish Kedashim, and now look, there's animals r- running around free, and he was laughing. They were crying. So they asked him, why are, you, why are you laughing? It's a very serious situation. And he said that the Nabi Zechariah in his Nevi'ah said that one day before Mashiach's time, there'll be a time where the jackal, where the, where the fox will run through the, through the base of major, through the Kachik and Dashim. Of course, when he said it, nobody could ever believe such a time. But he said, but that will be the prefix to Mashiach. So I'm laughing that the Nevi'ah is coming true. So... I see that that Bezrat Hashem Mashiach will be here soon. The Gemara says very clearly, where the Gemara talks about Mashiach, there will come a time that there will be no Gedalim left, and there will be no leaders of Klai Yisrael left, and the Jewish nation will have to turn to God. And we see we lost a lot of Gedalim in the last two years, Rav Scheinberg, a lot of, a lot of very big people, uh, Rav Yudel Lefkowitz, and there's not many left. And that's exactly what the Gemara said would happen. So it's not like a shock, the Gemara said, there will come a time when there won't be any more. There won't be any more um, people of that level that Klai Yisrael will say, listen, we don't have to worry about nothing. We have Eliyasha, we have Rebchayim, we have this, we have that one. We have nothing to worry about. There will come a time when we'll realize we have nobody. And at that time, Klai Yisrael will turn to Akash Baruch Hu. And that's when Mashiach will come. And the lesson to be learned is why do we have to wait for someone to die um, to bring Mashiach? So if we do tshuva and we grow on our own, then we don't have to wait that that, that whole the vias has to come true, that every god will pass away. There's not that many left. And um, it's a time for us. Rabbi Yashiv represented halacha. He was the head of Dayanam. He was the head. He, when it came to halacha, he was, there was no one above him. Rabbi Yashiv paskin something. There was nobody in this generation that could paskin against it. So I think that the thing that we need to take from his death, that he's not here anymore, is that we should take a halacha, one law, one Jewish law, one halacha that has to do with women, and you should take that halacha, and you should, from tonight on, be very strict in that halacha. There's a, there's a story. There was a king, and um, he was very, very well loved, and he ran the whole country, and he was a very good king. And one day, he invited everybody in the country to come to a party in the castle. Nobody knew why. He didn't tell anybody why. He said, I want everyone to be in my castle. So, you can imagine there were thousands of people, this huge banquet room. 
And every person that walked in was, handle, was handed by the guard a candle and a match. Come to the king's party, lavish feast, lavish food. Beautiful, beautiful, huge chandelier. It was very famous, this castle. Had a chandelier with thousands and thousands of crystals. Very, very bright. It was like the center of the room. It was the beauty of the room. And they didn't understand. If there's a beautiful chandelier, why do we need candles? And they said, why do we need candles? And the guard said, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. King said, every person that walks in here gets one candle and a match. So everybody was wondering. They're eating, they're talking, they're socializing. And everybody was wondering, what's with the candle? And then all of a sudden, the light, the be beautiful big chandelier, went out. And the room was in total darkness. And no matter how much good food you have, you can't see the person next to you and you can't see the food. It's not going to do you much good. So they realized, they weren't silly people, they realized that it's dark and they don't want to, so what could they do? They didn't have flashlights in those days. So they took out their candle and their match and they struck it and they lit their candle. Thousands and tens of thousands of people lighting their candle. And all of a sudden the whole room was lit up again. So many thousands of candles. And the king got up to speak. And the king said, you're all very dependent on me because I've been taking care of you all the time. He said, but I'm very old and I just found out I'm very sick and I'm not going to be here much longer. So sort of the chandelier, it's going to get dark. But you need to know that if every single one of you just lights one little candle, then the room will be as bright as when the chandelier was here. He said, many of you will think that you can't take my place. You can't run a country. You don't know how to run a country. He says, you're wrong. If everyone in my country, if every person that's in my country lights one little candle, then you'll have the same light that when I was here. Well, Yashav, of Shalom, who passed away today, was that chandelier. His being on this world, his being part of Klai Yisrael, for sure protected us. For sure brought a Kedusha into the world, being that he was the Galahad Dor, he was the shepherd of Klai Yisrael. For sure was a huge chandelier. But today the chandelier went out, and he's no longer here. So what do you do? You walk around in darkness, and panic, and I can't tell you how many people in Shul by Mincha said to me, it's over, the world is over, our protector is gone. We're all going to die. I'm like, no. Your protector is not Rabbi Yashov. Your protector is a Kosh Baruch Hu. And we're his children. He's not going to let us all die. Don't panic. Moshe Rabbeinu died. And there was never a Moshe Rabbeinu again. But there was a Yeshua. And then Yeshua died. And there were Nevi'im and there were Malachim and there were Shaiftim. Hashem doesn't leave us to the wolves. There's no question that we lost an R, we lost a light. We lost a Kedusha at the top of Klai Yisrael. But if every single person in Klai Yisrael takes one little candle, takes one halacha, I'm not telling you to take a hundred halacha, one halacha, whatever that halacha is, and says, Hashem, there used to be a Gadol Hadar, and he was the shepherd, we don't have him anymore, so now each one of us has to work harder. If the main... Lahavdil, if the main ball player on the team breaks a leg or gets sick and he can't get on to the team, what does the coach say? Give up? We forfeit? No. He says, every one of you has to play 105% now. 100% is not enough. Because 100% worked when he was on the team. But he's not on the team anymore because he got hurt. So now you to give me 120%. Every person has to step up. That's the lushan that we use in sports. You got to step up because our main player didn't make it today. So that's the reaction, not panic, it's over, the end of the world, but just the opposite. Now I'm more needed because Rabbi Yashua is not here. So now I need to step up, I need, I need to, to light my candle. And if that's what we all do, there's no question that there's Rat Hashem, don't worry, because Baruch still loves us, and he's still going to watch us, and he's still going to take care of us, and, it's, and we're his children. Did we lose something? Yes. So we have to step up, and we have to fill that place. Am I a early usher? No. Are you going to become a early usher? No. But if each one of us, nobody became that king once he died. 
But if they learned from that little example that every one of them held a candle, guess what? The room was just as bright when the, as when the chandelier was on. So that's what Klai Yisrael has to do. And this is the nine days and the three weeks. And the nine days and the three weeks, that's what it's all about. You know, the, the first base on Migdash, we, we killed people. We bowed down to idols. We were totally immoral. Three, a really bad combination. And we, Hashem destroyed the base of Migdash, and we were in Golis for 70 years. And he brought us back. The second base of Migdash, we didn't kill nobody. We didn't serve Abu Dizara. We, didn't, we were not immoral. We just didn't get along with each other. Sinas chinam. Hating another person for no reason. Why don't you like her? I just don't like her. But really, why don't you like her? I just don't like her. I, I just don't I like the way she talks, the way she looks. Just pure hatred. Not that the person did anything to you. For absolutely no reason. The biggest subject that I have been asked to speak about in the last three months, which I have not spoken here about, the biggest subject that people are saying, well, Watson, you have to get up and speak about it. This was never a subject in all the years of teaching. It was a teeny little thing that used to happen in girls' schools and sometimes in boys' schools, but it definitely wasn't the headlines. Today, it's the headlines in the Jewish community with kids, in camp, in school. It's the headlines by the guy. Bullying. Where girls bully other girls. You cannot come to my party. You're not one of my friends. I don't want to go to the same camp that you go. We're six girls, and we have a little clique, and I, I don't want to say anything bad about girls, but there's definitely more cliques and drama in girls' school than there is in boys' school drama as a subject. In girls' school, drama is life. Mm -hmm. It's a very big difference. And even this year in the, in the camps, in the camps, I'm getting calls that, that, that you got to talk to, this, to these girls because these three girls... They're rooting the whole camp for the rest of the girls. They're, they're snobby, and they, and they put everybody down. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's camp. You're going there to have a good time. What do you mean they're putting everyone down? And I went to one of the camps, and I spoke to the... I don't, we don't like them. Why do we have to be friendly with them, Ryan Wallstein? Where does it say in the Torah? You have to be friendly with them. Right? We don't want to talk to them. We don't have anything to do with them. That, for sure, is the worst thing that Clydesville can do. Because guess what? Because of Sinas Chinam in the second base of Midash, it's 2,000 and some odd years, and we still are in Golos. Not 70 years. Because until we get along with each other, HaKash Baruch is not bringing Mashiach. He could sing all day long, we want Mashiach. If we don't get along with each other, it doesn't work. And it's becoming <laughs> bigger and bigger, and I know why it's becoming bigger and bigger. Why is it? It's such a, it's such a, this bullying, forget about online. You shouldn't be online, right? Forget about the kid that killed, that got, mama killed herself, committed suicide because she was being bullied. That was by the Goyim. It was a big case that the kid who bullied her, they, they brought up on, on, on murder charges, right? So, but why? Why would I bully someone else? Why would a girl go to school or go to camp and like tell her friends, don't talk to her? Where does that come from? That's, that's a symptom, right? But why? So I know why. It's the disease of this generation. And the, one of the symptoms of the disease of this generation is bullying, is sinas chinam. It comes from low self-esteem. If you don't think much of yourself, the way for you to think much of yourself is to step on other people. If I think I'm short and I take four people and I lay them on top of each other and then I step on them, I became tall. But that's not really, you really did not become tall. You're still the same height. You just happen to be standing on other people. You yourself did not grow at all. And that's the mistake the kids think. That if us four are clicky and we don't let her in, so now I'm somebody. No, you're the same nobody. You're the same nobody. You're just stepping on someone else. You didn't change. You didn't become somebody by stepping on. So this, this whole low self-esteem, which causes drugs, which causes cutting, which causes all kinds of crazy stuff, right? One of the symptoms, not in the drastic symptom for the girl who says I will never do drugs I'm not going to become a Chal Shabbos I'm not going to rebel so what am I going to do with my low self esteem I'm going to take it out on other kids and it's mamish, vicious it's vicious, it's evil it's destructive how many girls started camp this year who are now home because the kids in their bunk made them so uncomfortable they bullied them so the poor kid had to leave camp, can't have fun, 
and ended up going home. I would say hundreds from all the camps put together. Yes? The online is not working? Do you have Jake's number? Do I have Jake's number? I'm sorry. Okay, hold on. Take out my cell phone. It never started working? It started and then it stopped, so I don't know what happened. So that means we're giving a good shit tonight. Yates yeah, doesn't want it. Right. My phone's dead. No, so just give me the number. My phone's dead. I can't turn it on. Right. See? It's not meant to be. What can I do? Huh? You don't have Jake's number? Call Avi Vich. She has Jake's number. My phone's dead. I don't have any numbers. My phone's dead. <laughs> All right. So it's not supposed to be online. Oh, wait. Well, it came back to life. Tchis Mason. See, I told you Mashiach's coming. Tchis Mason. Jake. Jake, 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 Jake. Jake's number is 718-415. Yeah. Two, two, five, eight. Oh, I, I didn't want to put it on the line. That's why I didn't say and it. It's, that's the cell? Or is that's the cell. Okay, fine. All right. Anyway, so I would like to tell you a story about bullying, um, which I read this week, which to me is so amazing. And, and this, is, this is the three weeks. I mean, this is the time we have to work on this. And, and adults don't, well, adults don't, we don't call it bullying, but adults do the same thing. When a kid sees that his mother is telling her friend on the phone, no, I don't want her to be. I don't want her to go on this trip. I don't want her to, you know, to come to my wedding. And when the kids hear this, so it's, it's a, we call adult bullying. It's not called bullying, but you know, our kids learn from us also when we talk bad about people in the kitchen or on our cell phones, and they're listening. So then, why should they talk good about people? So as adults and as parents, we have to be as careful how we treat our mother-in-law and how we talk about our mother-in-law behind her back or or anybody, because kids. One thing about kids. They absorb when they see a hypocrite. They immediately, that's one, one of the things that adults sometimes we understand people are hypocritical, kids don't understand that at all. So if my mother is talking bad on the phone about, she's going somewhere with her friends and she's like, just make sure this woman doesn't know that we're going, then that kid will do exactly the same thing. There's no way out of that. If you, kids don't do what they're told, they do what they see. So you have to be very sensitive at home to be careful and how you talk about other people, and, and when, even when you're making a wedding, and you're sitting there, and the kid's listening, and you're like, well, don't invite them, they didn't invite us, and don't invite that one. So that when the kid makes a party, or she's going somewhere, so she does the same thing. Parents don't realize that we do, we do it very often, and kids pick this up, and they, they're not hypocritical. If that's what my mother does, that's what I can do. So I, we have to be very careful, and, and it's terrible what it's doing in schools. I mean, there are kids that are hurting themselves because they're being so put down by other kids that their mom is physically hurting themselves. And those other kids are going to have to give din v'cheshben for what they did to this other kid. And they have no idea what they're doing to this other kid. It can cause suicide. It can go that far. You have to be very, very careful. Not chas to, to to bully anybody. And, and to be very sensitive to, to other people. You have to realize, I think what we have to realize is that we're one. That Klai Yisrael is one body. And, and you're not going to you're not going to go out tonight after my share and say, listen, I'm very hungry. I'm going to go to the pizza shop, but I'm not inviting my hand. My hand can't come. What are, be, what are you, nuts? How can you talk like that, right? I'm not, my eye can't come. I'm going out. My eye's not allowed to come. You say, what are you talking about? Your eye has to come. Your hand has to come. It's part of your body. What do you mean, sugar? You're going to cut your, your arm off before you go, to go out for pizza? What are you talking about? When you say... This girl can't come, you are saying, my hand can't come. That's what you're saying. Because every one of us is part of one body. We are part of one body. So when you leave this one out on purpose, you are saying, uh, I'm going to the pizza shop, but my hand can't come along with me. That's how you have to look at it. Of course you can come. Of course we want you to be there. Unless you're a bad influence, a very bad influence. Of course we want you to be there. It's, and we're losing that. The little bit that we had... Of, of Achdus, I just heard a story today, uh, uh, last night. I went to be, no, was it, today? it was today. I went to be Menachem Abel, someone today. She just lost her mother. So her mother, her mother and all the brothers, they're all not here anymore. She was 84. She has one sister, two sisters that are alive. One is, is dementia, she doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on. The other one is sitting there, this other sister is sitting there. 
So his other sister was telling the story that she was in the concentration camp. Unbelievable story. Okay, so let's... The woman that passed away, okay, who's 84 years old, so she had two sisters, she had actually three sisters, and a mother, and they came to, the, to Auschwitz. They came to the concentration camp. Mengele Yamach Shemal, the doctor, when this woman who passed away's mother uh, lined up, she had a little sister also. So Mengele said, the mother and the little sister, to the gas chamber. Now there were two other sisters of this woman that was sitting there today that there were four girls all together. That little girl, the, the, the woman who died, the woman that's sitting Shiva, and, and the one that has dementia. So she said, her two sisters, just how, uh, that she was online. The next two online. Now her and her sister were a year apart and they looked Mamash exactly alike. So Mengala asked her, are you twins? And they weren't. They were a year apart. She doesn't even know why she said it. She said yes. Now Mengala was doing a lot of terrible, terrible experiments on twins. He had a thing about twins. So the minute she said we're twins, he said, good. You go to the live side. And they took them to some room somewhere, terrible room, and they locked them in that room. And these two girls started screaming. So finally, they were screaming so loud, one of the SS men came to the door. And he opened the door and he said, why are the two of you screaming? You're in a room, no one's doing anything to you. Why are you screaming? So she said, I was screaming to tell you that we're not really twins. Now at that point, they could have been killed. She said, we're not really twins. I don't know why I told that man that we were twins. He just asked me if I'm twins. I said, yes, but we're, not, we're really not twins. So the SS guy said, oh, if you're not twins, then he doesn't want you. Go into Auschwitz, go into the camp. They went in alive. She said that because she was stronger and older, she had a better job than her sister. So she got two pieces of bread. Her sister got one piece of bread. And she said that the whole time she was in Auschwitz, she gave her sister the other piece of bread to keep her alive, she was younger than her. And she gave the other piece of bread that she got most of it to another young girl that needed to live. Did anyone teach her this? Did she go to school? They didn't go to school. Women in Europe, before, before the Holocaust, there was no Rabbi Wallstein, there was no Ornava. These ladies, they don't understand why you girls even go to a share. They think it's the funny, like, what are these people talking about? At 7th grade, 6th, 7th grade, they went home. There was no more school for them. They worked in the house. They got married young. There was no school. There was very few classes. So who taught them this emuna? Who taught this ben adam lechaveiro? We have girls that sit in Beis Yaakov and other schools, and they have teachers that teach a subject ben adam lechaveiro. Remember Wallstein and, and Charlie Harari and all the guys and all the speakers. We talk and we give shiurim and we talk. Forget about giving bread to someone else. Just the opposite. She said. Where do you get this from? I want to understand. Where do you get this to give your bread? You're starving to another person who's, who's a little younger than you. You know what the answer is? Mizen and Yidin. That was the whole answer. Yeah, We're Jews. That's the whole answer. Not I heard a shir. I went to Chabura. We're Jews. Like, like, what are you, like Red Walston, what are you asking me? What's the question? When did you give up your bread? Like, we're Jews. Not I learned it in a safer. That's who we are. We're B'nai Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. Avram Avinu treated three Arabs like they were his own children. And we're not treating our own Jewish sisters like they're even family. With all the shiurim, with all the classes, with all the seminaries, we're going to Israel for two years, we do the same thing. We don't invite this one. I don't like that one, to my wedding, to my this, to my that. We don't tell this one about the boy that we just went out that we think may be for them because he, he said no to me, so why should I let her? Crazy stuff. What happened to them is that Yidin? This is why we don't have a sheikh. Not because of, of internet, and not because of Facebook, and not because of television, and not because of movies. 
Because that's what they had in the first base of Megdash. And 70 years later, Hashem built another one. Sin has chinam? God doesn't have anything to do with us. And, and as a parent, I 100% understand Hashem. Because to sit at a table with your own kids and they're not getting along with each other makes you crazy as a parent. You would rather not sit at that Shabbos table. You come to, I'm, I have, can I know five daughters? If I come to that Shabbos table and my daughters are not talking to each other because they're in a fight and they're, and they're yelling at each other, I'm out of there. I, I don't want to make kiddush. I don't want to eat. I don't want to sing Zemiris. I don't want to say Dvatara. My kids aren't getting along. I'm not, I'm not happy. Any parent will tell you that. I'd rather they get along than anything else. Because Baruch feels the same way. You're going to camp and you're making a kid so sick you're hurting her so much that she has to go home in a, in a week into camp? Or she's cutting herself? Or she's hurting herself? Or she's suicidal because you're picking on her? We're crazy. We're out of our minds. And that's why the base of the destroyed. That's what we're sitting right now. Once again, Friday is, is Rishkodesh Av. Last year, Tisha B'Av, I said, that's it. It's over. We're going to be in Eretz Yisrael. We're coming up to Rishkodesh Av on Friday. And we're still in the same place. And we lost seven Israelis today. And we lost Rabbi Yashav. And we lost a 12-year-old boy who never didn't have era because he was never by mitzvah. So Hashem took three kind of karbonas today. The head of Klai Yisrael, a boy that never didn't have era, and seven Israelis that, that had a little vacation. They blew him up. What's going on? Everyone's like, I don't understand what's going on. What's going on is you don't get along with each other. If the body doesn't get along with each other, then the body dies. The one cell, the terrible number, the terrible word, I don't want to say it, the one disease that's the most destroying disease ever, ever in the whole world is one cell that doesn't go with the rest of the body. So what happens? You have to give you chemo. What's chemo? To kill that cell, you've got to kill all the good cells too. Because the media can negative in that disease. You can't just kill that cell. The good go with the bad. And that's what it says. When it comes to sinas chinam, when people don't get along, the good go with the bad. David HaMelech, when he went to war... Even though he won, he lost many soldiers. I think it was Achav. When he went to war, he didn't lose one soldier. He was a Russia. He served Avay Dezara. But it says, the Chavetz Chaim says, that everybody got along in Klai in those days. Hashem didn't let anyone die. David HaMelech, he was a big tzaddik. His, his, his army were tzaddikim. Many of them died. Because they were not getting along with each other. And, and that's what we need to, we have nine, we're coming to the nine days. We have to work on this. We have to work on this. It doesn't give you self-esteem to destroy somebody else. Just the opposite. It does nothing for you. Nothing. It's like the midget who jumped on the giant's shoulder and said, I'm taller than everybody else. No, you're still the midget. You're just on a giant's shoulder. It didn't change. So I read a story this week. Mind-boggling. And we need to learn from this little boy. This little nine-year-old boy. So it's a true story. Rabdo Brizak wrote it. So there's, um, there's this kid, a nine-year-old kid, who's really getting bullied in school. And he happens not to be so smart. He has a terrible memory. He's not very smart. But not only is he being bullied in school, at home, his brothers and sisters always make fun of him and his cousins because he doesn't say smart things. Not a smart kid. So they call him stupid. They call him all kinds of names. And he's taking this for years and years and years. All of a sudden, his father sees that every time one of the other kids insults him and says something nasty to him, he starts mumbling. Father's like, we need to take him to a therapist, right? Who knows what curses, you know, this kid's saying under his breath. We have to find out what's going on. Well, let's first talk to his Rebbe, see what's going on in school. So the father goes, the mother goes to speak to the Rebbe, and they're like, we're just wondering, do you see my son mumbling a lot? It's like something that just started. And the Rebbe says, you know what? I was going to call you. A whole day he's mumbling to himself. And every time a kid makes fun or they don't let him play, he starts mumbling. He says, I, 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 I'm, I'm scared to listen to what he's saying because I, I think he's saying nasty words. And if I hear those words, then I have to throw them out of yeshiva. So I'm trying to stay away when he mumbles not to hear what he's saying. So the father's like, we got to do something. And Nebuch is he's cracking up. The kid's cracking up. He's mumbling to himself. So he calls the little boy into his room at night. And he says, you know, I've realized lately that when your siblings make fun of you, or your cousins make fun of you, you start mumbling. 
And I spoke to your Rebbe today, and he said that you do this in school too. What are you saying? Like, you know, I'm your father. I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to punish you. I think we need to go for help. Are you cursing? Are you saying nasty words? You know, what are you saying to yourself? Just tell me the words that you're saying to yourself. So this is a true story. So this little boy turns to his father and he says, I'll tell you what I'm saying. I'll tell you the truth. He said, my Rebbe, a few weeks ago, told us a story. This lady was married for 24 years and didn't have children. And she came to Chaim Kainevsky. And she said to Chaim, I need a bracha, actually a haftacha, not a bracha, a guarantee, a haftacha, a promise, that I'm going to have a child. It's 24 years and I haven't had a child. So Chaim said, I don't have that. I can give you a bracha, I can't give you a haftacha. I can't give you a promise that you're going to have a child. 24 years without a child, I can't give you such a promise. But I know someone that can. You have haftacha? After 24 years? He says, well, I don't know the person, but I can tell you how to get a haftacha. So she and her husband said, okay. And he said the following. He said, find somebody who gets embarrassed in public and doesn't answer. Takes the embarrassment and doesn't answer. Her bracha or his bracha is a haftacha. Whatever they're going to tell you, it's going to happen. Because a person who's able to be embarrassed in public and not answer has more koyach in Shemayim, more strength in Shemayim than I do. She says, where am I going to find someone like that? I should, go, I should go embarrass somebody in the street and then ask him for a bracha? Like, like how do you set this up? And Chaim said, that I'll give you a bracha for. I'll give you a bracha that you should find someone that can give you a haftacha. That's a true story. So, went month, two months, she, you, you can't find someone that gets embarrassed in public. It's not, it's not, not something, you know, but she looked. To, you know, she went to things, to parties. She comes to a wedding. And the way the story is told, she comes to a wedding. And this woman, this girl is getting married. This girl had an aunt, right, who got divorced. In other words, her uncle, which is her actual relative, was married to a woman. And that woman got divorced. So that woman doesn't belong at the wedding anymore. She's the enemy of that family. But that woman was very close to this girl, her niece. While she was married, it was her niece. So she, now it's her ex-niece, but she was very, very close to this niece. But she wasn't invited to the wedding because she was an ex. She decided she's going to the wedding. Now this girl, who, this woman who didn't have children for 24 years is also at the wedding. And she walks in and they're by, the, by the dancing and she comes into the circle to dance with her ex-niece, so to say. And she walks over to her niece, and her ex-mother-in-law comes running into the circle, grabs her by the hand, and starts screaming, Get out of here! You, you destroyed our family! You destroyed your children! You destroyed my son! Mom is in front of everybody, pulling her out of the circle, and embarrassing this, this ex-daughter-in-law in front of the whole place. And of course, all the dancing stopped. You have this woman ranting and raving, and this poor ex is standing there, and the girl who really wanted to dance, her niece, her ex-niece, but you know, she saw her mother, so she backed off, and this woman ran out of the, ran out of the wedding. This girl, this 20, woman who didn't have children for 24 years, runs after her. She thinks that it's someone from the wedding running after her to yell, what kind of chutzpah, to come to a wedding you're not invited, so she runs faster, away from the girl who wants the bracha. So she's screaming, stop, stop, I want a bracha. I just get kicked out of a wedding, someone's running after me, I want a bracha. It's a little, you know, it's like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense over here. It's a true story. Anyway, she stops. This girl runs over to her. She says, I need a bracha from you. She goes, for me, what, what? She goes, I, have, I don't have children for 24 years. And I just saw what happened. Give me a bracha. She said, no, nothing happened. I have no problem with what they did. I knew I took a chance and that, that might happen. I'm not angry. She goes, I know, that's why. I need a bracha from you. So she took her name, whatever her name was, Miral Bas, whatever it was. She said, I give you a bracha that this year you should have a child. She went home. She told her husband the whole story. That year she had a child. 
She went back to Rav Chaim Kainevsky. He said, he's the one who said over the story. And she said, I want to give you a Pesuit Toiva. You, you gave me a bracha that I should meet such a person. This is what happened at the wedding. I went over to her and I got a bracha for her child. And Baruch Hashem, she brought the baby to get a, a boy to get a bracha from, from Rav Chaim. And he gave her bracha, whatever it was. He also, I think he said, by the way, you asked for a baby, you should have asked for Mashiach. But okay, whatever. But <laughs> Lamai said that's what she was at. And she talked had a child. So the little nine-year-old boy looks up at his father and says, Tati, ever, ever since I heard that story, I said, why should I waste when people embarrass me? So I look through all the newspapers and I look in shul at all the names that need Rufur Shalema. And I memorized a lot of those names. So every time one of my cousins or my brothers or someone in school says something nasty to me and embarrasses me, instead of answering back, I, don't, I just under my breath say all these people's names. So his father said, but you don't have a good memory. How do you remember all these names? And he says, you want to hear? And he starts rattling off 20, 30 names that need Rufur Shalem. Nine-year-old boy. Not a 20-year-old, not a 40-year-old, nine-year-old boy. So in yeshiva, every time a kid said, you can't play, you can't come to my house, he said, Rufur Shalema, Chayim Ha'Moshe, Rufur Shalema. That's what he was mumbling. What a lesson from a nine-year-old boy. What a crazy lesson. And that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. Ben Alma Chavero. We need to do Ben Alma Chavero. And that's what we need to take on ourselves in the next nine, ten days towards Tisha B'av, that, that we're one body. And you don't go anywhere without your fingers, your hands, or your head. Right? You didn't say tonight, I'm coming to Rabbi Wallace share. I'm leaving my head at home. Well, if you go somewhere and you leave someone out, that's what you're doing. You're leaving a part of Kleistro's body out. And it's mamish assassination. It's character assassination. And I see it with little kids, little teeny kids, and they grow up to do it as teenagers, and they grow up to do it as mommies. This, this, this empowering myself with my chevra by leaving and hurting other people. There's nothing nastier in Hashem's eyes. Nothing. So we'll end with this story. Some of you have heard it. I've said it here before. But who, what a Jew is. What we are natural. I, I can't get over what she just said. She's like, how could you give away your last piece of bread? She says, she was like looking at like we're nuts. Like, does any need? Like, what are you thinking? Like, how else would you do it? So far from that. With all our learning and all our teaching and all our shiurim and all that, because we don't really take in. We don't really know who we are. We're so we have so much stuff. They didn't have stuff. They had no stuff. Fifteen-year-old girl. She went home. She helped her mother. She helped big chalas. No stuff. They weren't busy with all that stuff. So if there were ten other girls in the town that were Jewish. Of course, invited everybody else. It was the greatest pleasure to invite everybody else. We don't need to show another Holocaust to find out that we're all one. Hitler looked at all of us one, religious, not religious, Sephardi, Ashkenazi. Did it make a difference at all to him? The same gas chamber for the kid who wasn't religious and the kid with the long pace did not make a difference to him. So we have to reverse that. If it didn't make a difference to him, how can it make a difference to us? He was the killer. He was the, he was a Moloch. To him, every Jew was a Jew. But to us, they're not. We're not. Hello? You're always there for me. Thank you, Nechama. So I want to end with this story. Amazing story. Some of you have heard it before. So there was this king, and a priest came to him and said, non-Jewish kids are much smarter than Jewish kids. And the king said, really? He said, yep. So he called the rabbi in. He said, is that true? The rabbi said, No. It's not true. The king said, good. We're going to make a test. We're going to see who's smarter. We're going to take the first, we're going to take the, it was actually 20. Take 20 Christian kids, non-Jewish kids, put them in a room, at a long table, 10 bowls of soup on one side of the table, 10 bowls of soup on the other side of the table with a matzo ball and some noodles. And the king said like this. We're going to run a test. Every single kid is going to get a spoon. Spoon is four feet long. This long. Now, you got to take your spoon, you got to eat your matzo ball, your noodles, and your soup without spilling. I'm going to give you five minutes to empty that bowl. Then we're going to do it with the Jewish kids. And the team that wins is the team that spills the least and eats the most. So, they put 10 kids on one side of the table, non-Jewish, 10 kids on the other side of the table, 
Each kid gets a big bowl of soup, full to the top, with a matzo ball and noodles. They all sit down. The king goes upstairs by the window to watch with the rabbi and the priest. They're going to watch how this is going to go. So they close the door, and the kids are like, this is not going to work. The spoon is this long from the bowl. How are you going to do it? Put it in the bowl. You can't get it into your mouth. So they're like, this is the king's... He's, you know what? Nobody's watching. He took the bowl. Right? And like, okay, that one's disqualified. Number four on the, that side of the table. They saw him do that, right? Next kid tries. Of course, it spills on his shirt. It spills on the table. He can't get it into his mouth. So he's throwing it up, trying to swallow it. And then, you know, they start... They're like, this king set us up. It's, it's impossible. You can't eat soup from a four-foot spoon. It's impossible. They're like, you know what? This is silly. One kid takes his soup, throws it at the other kid, and all of a sudden, food fight! Everybody throwing matzo balls, and kids are full of noodles and matzo balls. The room looks like a disaster area. Five minutes are up, they walk in, soup is all over the place, on their shirts, and they're on, the, on the table, on the floor, matzo balls on the wall. Disaster! But the kids had a good time. <laughs> so they all leave they clean up the whole room and they bring 20 Jewish kids in 10 on one side of the table 10 on the other side of the table fill up the bowls, matzo bowl, soup, noodle you sit down okay the rules of the contest is you got to use this 4 foot spoon and you cannot spill any soup it's going to be hard to lose this game because they pretty much got every, all the soup is all over the place but well, let's see what you can do they lock the door, they go upstairs Jewish kids are sitting there, take out the spoon. This is not going to work. But the king's not stupid. And he wouldn't give us a test that we can't do. So the kids are looking at the other kids on the other side of the table, and they're like, it's simple. If I put my spoon in my soup and feed you, and you put your spoon in your soup and feed me, we're not going to spill anything. So you got 10 kids on one side, taking their soup and their matzo ball, feeding the guy on the other side. Then he takes his soup and feeds this guy on the other side. And within five minutes, all the soup, all the matzo ball, all the noodles are eaten without one drop on a table or on someone's shirt. And the king and the priest and the rabbi are watching this. And it's unbelievable. And the king turns to the rabbi and says, how come Jewish kids are so smart? And the rabbi said something that I will never forget when I read this story. He said, they're not. They're not any smarter than the non-Jewish kids. He says, the difference between a Jewish kid and a Jewish person and anybody else, the Jewish person always looks at the person across the table, not at themselves. And when you look at the person across the table, then it works. They wouldn't even think. It wasn't a big thought process. It's simple. Just feed the guy across the table. But if you're never used to feeding the person across the table, you don't think that way. You don't think that way. So you're not looking at him. You're trying to figure out, how do I get that soup into my mouth? Not how do I get that soup into his mouth. That's the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. Because we have DNA from Avram Avinu, which is chesed which means that we don't look at ourselves, we look at the other person in Auschwitz that needs a piece of bread. It's not important that I have bread, it's important that she has bread. And that's what this woman told me today! Because on the day that I give a share, Hashem always sends me what I need. She said, Jewish girls are not smarter than non-Jewish girls. So why did you give them the bread? The Zenin Yidin. We look at the other person. We're just Jews. It's what we do. And that is breaking down right now, this generation, in a big way. And if we're going to allow it to happen, then there's going to be matzo balls on the wall and soup in other people's face and soup all over you. This generation has to start looking at the person who's sitting across the table, not at themselves. And maybe... If that's what we're going to do, and we're going to take on ourselves in the nine days to start looking at the other person instead of myself, then maybe the person sitting across from the table, Bezrat Hashem, will be Mashiach. That's how you bring Mashiach. Shalabat Slacha.